Welcome to all of you. My name is Judith Royer. I am one of the Sisters of St. Joseph and the director of the CSJ Center for Reconciliation and Justice, one of the producers of this session's presentation, which is part of the annual CSJ Center Symposium, Faces of Justice, Transforming Thought, Transforming Action. I'd like to welcome you on behalf of Loyola Marymount University, the CSJ Center for Reconciliation and Justice, and our guests today from Providence St. Joseph Health Mission Leadership Institute. The Sisters of St. Joseph, the CSJs, were founded to minister in health and education with preference for the poor and those in need. In terms of health services, the CSJ sisters opened hospitals and eventually formed St. Joseph Health System, which more recently joined with the Providence Health System. The dilemma for all hospitals is that healthcare is a big business and not all mission statements match each other in values and practices. So some critical questions become, how is, or should a Catholic health system be any different from any other health system? And how is the founding values of say the Sisters of St. Joseph demonstrating themselves in our current day and under current circumstances? In response to questions like this, Providence St. Joseph Health, little sidebar here, which you will often see branded as simply as Providence, to accommodate other combinations, such as Providence St. John's in Santa Monica, Providence Little Company of Mary in Torrance, and so forth. But to accommodate those questions, Providence St. Joseph Health has initiated mission officer positions in our hospitals. Last year, the CSJ Center at LMU joined with Martin Shriver, Vice President of Providence Mission Leadership Institute to interview and dramatize personal stories of six chief mission officers in order to create a leadership training video documentary. We have selected three of these narratives to share with you today, which will be followed by a discussion with representatives from the health system and from this project's participants and artists. To introduce these stories, I would like to introduce Martin Schreiber, Vice President, Mission, Providence Mission Leadership Institute, Nancy Jordan, Associate Vice President, Providence Mission Leadership Institute, followed by Doris Baisley, playwright and adjunct professor of theater at Loyola Marymount University, who will talk a bit about the storytelling project. So Martin, I turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Sister Judith. This is an extraordinary moment where we have spent so much time unveiling what something could be, and I feel it is here now, and that is certainly a time for us to celebrate. And the Mission Leadership Institute was built around this idea of how in a changing environment of healthcare, would we provide a container for self-discovery? And tonight, as we unveil these names and we see these images and hear these stories, it is truly coming to a fruition of how is it that I come to know who I am? And in an ever-changing landscape, what does leadership look like? For as we all know, having gone through this pandemic, uh, there are times when we were finding our own trophies and we were also finding our own broken hearts. And how can we make sense of that? How can we have a story that is something beautiful, not just for our own lives, but for the world in which we create? Uh, health for a better world is how we talk about the vision of Providence St. Joseph Health. And what we've built within the Mission Leadership Institute has been currently 325 caregivers going through an 18 month journey as pilgrims. And we all know that in pilgrimages, we need to have places of rest and we need to have people who help us on that path. And so tonight, 
What I'd like to do is first say thank you to you, the CSJ Center, for giving us this opportunity to partner in this beginning relationship, which I can see lasting many years to come, but then also helping us to know what is the dynamic way of a learning discovery. And I'm gonna turn it over to Nancy Jordan, our AVP of the Mission Leadership Institute to help us just with what is it that we look forward to with these stories. Thank you, Martin. And thank you, Sister Judith. As Martin shared, this partnership is just so incredibly important and this project has been so, so powerful. And it contributes to what Martin referred to as a learning discovery, uh, which is a rather innovative pedagogy of the Providence Mission Leadership Institute and possibly innovative sort of in the world of formation. Uh, this isn't just simply an article or a, a, a lecture. Uh, this, uh, what you will see today, will become an important resource, a critical resource for the formation of emerging mission leaders for today's day, for the signs of the times, for where we sit right now in an unpredictable sort of chaotic world. Uh, one standout for me, and Martin sort of uh, referenced it when he spoke about just sort of ref, you know reflection and, and, and taking a look at ourselves and finding our broken hearts and our joys, um, is this very element of self-reflection that is really brought out by this particular exercise. And by that, I mean, um, we are hearing our personal stories spoken back to us, which is both artistic and incredibly insightful. We see, we hear the words of our stories and, and it changes us. We're so grateful to this entire team, again, to this partnership, I cannot say it enough, to our, uh, our, our writers, our producers, our actors, and all of our participants. This creation will impact so many people in so many ways for so many years. And I am just appreciative about what is to come. And I look forward to it. So thank you, and I hope you enjoy. Thanks. So I'm, I'm gonna say just a few words about how we put together this uh, piece, which we call Paths and Moments. And it, the idea was to introduce six mission leaders to uh, the trainees at the Institute. And to do it, we used a process that Judith and I have been working on through our Voices of Justice class at LMU. Now for this project, the idea was to gather stories from the mission leaders that would tell about mission but not as theory or philosophy or statistics, not capital M mission, but as personal experience. And those would be from childhood, from, from unexpected or everyday moments in their lives. And to do the interviews, the writing and the performing, we worked with our favorite team of writers and actors who I think are here today watching, I hope. And we came out with what I think of as a series of portraits. And these portraits of the six mission leaders tell really express who they are in a way that you couldn't do in a photograph or an essay. They are really kind of video portraits performed by the writers who worked on them. These are three that you're gonna see today. These are three of the six pieces. The recording lasts about an hour. And we would love you to join us for a Q&A afterwards. We'll actually have the whole audience on if they wanna turn on their cameras and speak or not, it's up to you. And um, now uh, here it is, it's paths and moments. tell you what, I have to be very thoughtful about this mission work. It's something 
I started in my heart when I was very young to prepare myself. I had lots of compassion. I always wanted to share everything I had, especially with those who had nothing. But I want to share this with you. I talk about being fortunate personally. It was my dad's passion to play music in the church. And every Sunday morning, I had to work up very early and he would rush us all out of the house. It was scramble for five of us kids. And he would be counting down the hours and the minutes, you know, five more minutes, hurry up, hurry up, move, move. So by the time we get to the garage and get into the car, that's when we could catch our breath. So we get to the church and it's dark. There's nobody else there. My dad's opening the church with the key and he just loved playing music on the piano so much that he would go upstairs and play. And my mom would go up there with him and then it would be just us five kids down in the church waiting and we're stuck. Only I wouldn't just sit in any pew, I would go to the first pew and I would sit right in front of the altar and I would just pray. I would pray and I would cry and I think I think I was about six the first time I remember doing this. I was like, I just, I would just pray to God and, and the prayer that I would pray, I would ask him to just fill me. And I feel like somehow he did. Because throughout my life, my question has always been, am I living for God? So I joined a Catholic youth organization when I was about 11, and that really, really opened my eyes. It, it helped me practice my faith and taught me about service to others. We would go into these neighborhoods I mean, very poor neighborhoods. Neighborhoods I would never even have ventured into. And that's when I first realized what poverty meant. That's when I realized what it meant to be a really very vulnerable person and have nothing. The more I helped people, the more I realized I enjoyed it. And so then as I thought about my career, I knew I knew I wanted to do something that would help people, but I didn't know exactly what it would be like. I graduated from college and ended up coming to the US with my husband and kids. And it took me like months searching in my soul to find a job that would make a difference in other people's lives, that I could, could be like an advocate for them, that I could stand beside them and defend them when things were really, really challenging. So the funny thing is, I, I thought about going to nursing school, but then I thought, no, I, I think I'd rather be in the hospital, helping the nurses, helping the caregivers, doing things like that. And so I went to the administrative side and I decided to do compliance because that's how I get to help patients and help the caregivers when they have any issues or challenges. Then at church, I had brought the black people together. There were a lot of black people in this church, but we all came together and we formed a group we called the Pan-African Group. And we introduced a culture night where we had dinner and dancing and it was to educate the white people so that they would know that the black people they see are not like the black people they see on TV committing crimes and stuff like that. They, they got to see us as like human, that we have love, we give love, we touch, we care, we have desires, we go to school, we, we love our children. We, we want the best for our families, just like they want for their families. And it was, it was very successful. I mean, we, we had a lot of cultural awareness and connection and cultural understanding and appreciation of other people. <clears throat> Excuse me. Not to look down on someone because they're 
differ from you or they talk or they speak differently. And so somebody from the church, Mark Jupiter, he had gone to the vice president of mission and faith who was looking for someone to chair the cultural diversity council at Providence. And he said, why are you looking for somebody when Teresa is just here? So they came to me and they said, Teresa, please don't say no. So I said, why not? And you know, I would say it's a very turning moment of my life. I, I felt like God was calling me into a different direction. That's why I feel like when I came to Providence, I came home. I had started working with uh, caregivers to nurture them and to connect them to who they are and what brings them to work every day to help them with their own cultural competency and to take time and ask themselves, how can I make a difference in somebody's life today? And it, you know, it's not only about healing, but, but how can you truly be there for them when they need you the most? You know, like take away all your biases and become more inclusive and give equal opportunity to everyone. The thing about implicit bias is that it can happen when you're not looking. It can happen and you don't even know you're doing it. And so that's that's the big danger of it. And so then like if somebody would come in who's like black and you would look and you would say, well, this person is black, so I know they can tolerate pain, so I'm not gonna give them any painkillers. Or you look and this person is black and oh, so they must be very poor. So I'm not gonna re recommend this medication regimen or I'm not going to recommend this surgery and and unfortunately this does happen but these are these are some opportunities that we have it's one of the things we're slowly addressing now in our residency program and within the hospital I'm not going to say it's a big step a big shift but it's these are very young very very tiny baby steps we're taking right now. And like, for example, I've been asked to be on a subcommittee that's looking at establishing a diversity and inclusion council. And also at Providence, we've started looking at caregiver resource groups. And these would be like caregiver resource group for blacks, for Latinx, for LGBTQI, I mean, even uh, Asians and mothers. So the reason that we're looking at these groups is so that these groups can form and they can get among themselves and they can discuss some of the challenges that they have and, and they can have a voice and then they can work alongside the senior leadership to get some of their concerns addressed. Well, I'm going to go back now to my own life and my own story and my own person. I would say that one of the things that I wear every day is caring for others and having compassion. I thought I was a very compassionate person, but then my mother showed us what real compassion is. So she came to visit us when I had Michael. And my kids, my kids had tons of teddy bears. Up in their closet, they had like hundreds of teddy bears. And so unbeknownst to me, I'm off at work and my mother's circling the kids' room and she's picking these teddy bears. And so of course my daughter Rachel, she's crying and she's like, Grandma, I want my teddy bears. And Grandma's like, but can I take some of these teddy bears to the kids in Ghana? who don't have anything. So two years later, when we went home to Ghana, we get there and these kids are running up to Rachel, laughing and smiling and hugging us. And they were just so happy. And the teddy bears, the teddy bears were filthy. The teddy bears were so dirty. And I never even knew what was inside the teddy bear. The heads were coming off, the arms were coming off and all the stuff that's inside was coming out. So. Rachel was kind of teary, you know, and, and I said, look, Rachel, 
Do you see how these kids have loved your teddy bears? So two years later, when we were home and she was in high school, she comes home and she says, mommy, you know, I don't, I don't understand these kids here. They don't know anything about Africa and they, they don't do any fundraisers. I kind of knew I had done something right because Rachel was thinking about other kids. So she comes home one day and she's all jumpy and she's excited and she said, mommy, can I do a fundraising? Because since we're getting ready to go home to Ghana, I want to take teddy bears to the kids like grandma did. So I said, okay, I, I figured it'd be a handful of teddy bears and, and that would be fine. So the principal called and he said, when are you guys going to come collect these teddy bears? So we went there, we opened the door and all of these teddy bears come flying out. I mean, I was like, Rachel, what have you done? And so we didn't know there were all these teddy bears. We didn't know what are we going to do with all these teddy bears. So we went to Walmart and we got this suction thing and we were suctioning the teddy bears and she had some of her friends come over. So this is a Wednesday. We're leaving on Friday and we're just suctioning them all day, all day. We got like more than 20 bags. So we put the teddy bears in the suitcases. We go to the airport and well, so there's five of us traveling. So, you know, that means 10 bags are covered. So we have 10 more bags. And the lady from Delta says, I'm sorry, ma'am, but you are gonna have to pay $150 for each one of these other bags. I was so upset. It was too late to say no. So I used a credit card. We get on the plane and I was really upset. And Rachel, she just kept rubbing my arm and rubbing my hands. She was like, I'm sorry, mommy. I'm so sorry. I'll pay you back. I promise. I promise I'll pay you back one day. So we get there and we went to the hospitals. We went to the orphanages. We went to the villages and all the teddy bears were gone. We didn't even have enough teddy bears. I cried. I cried so much. I would always be the last one. I'd be the back somewhere wiping my tears, especially in the hospital. There was this one woman who came to me and she said, my son has not smiled in a month. You guys made him smile today. So when we got back, Rachel formed an organization and she named it Hugs for Ghana because the kids were all coming to us and hugging us and smiling. And she has a goal to put smiles on the faces of these kids. So <clears throat> then the boys wanted to join in. So they started collecting sports equipment and school supplies and books. So now we're going to Senegal and Tanzania and Liberia and Europe and even here in the US. And people can start their own charters now. And so if you wanna start a charter to send books somewhere like, let's say to Tennessee, you can have Hugs Dash. So that's what they call it now sometimes is Hugs Dash. So anyway, thought I was a compassionate person. But it took my daughter to come to me and say, mommy, can we send teddy bears? Can we take teddy bears? You know what? She opened my eyes because every time I would go home, I used to go with my suitcase empty. After this experience, I would never go home with an empty suitcase again. I would never, ever do that again but you know what every time I have emptied my cup God has filled it to overflowing I, I have a friend and she said do you understand what you did do you understand your kids sending books and school supplies and 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 sports equipment all across the world that God is going to continue to bless your children. And I was like, 
that's not why we're doing this. I always like to tell the stories of these wonderful French sisters from Montreal. Personally, I see them as very courageous, very, very brave. They took on the waters and the train and the bus and, and they traveled like several days. And, and when they got to Portland, they built little homes to take care of the sick. They built schools. They, they wanted to bring hope and love. And, and before you realize it, they grew. And now we have Providence St. Joseph Health System. And they did this work as an expression of God's love. So now that these sisters have moved on into blessed memory, now the question is, especially now when healthcare is so complex and so complicated and, and, and there's so much demand for the business side of it, the question now is, who will we have in the organization who will remain focused on the core of who we are? So my role here as mission leader is to make sure that in everything we do, working alongside our senior leaders, alongside our directors and the managers, make sure that in every decision we make, we're very thoughtful of our caregivers, we're very thoughtful of the poor and the vulnerable. We're very courageous in doing the right thing. And that we will be pleasing to carry out the image of what the sisters had when they started this ministry. But I'll tell you what, this missions job is everything. It's not like other positions where you go only in one department. I, I have to go into everywhere. I, the missions job runs to everything. It's almost like the Sisters of Providence. They started this organization so they could be across the board. And that's my role. My role is right across the board. I go in and out of everywhere. And that's why you have to be very tactful. I'm very thoughtful about how I present myself. There's not a lot of people like me anywhere around. And it's been that way throughout my career. Everywhere I've ever gone, always, I was always the only black woman in management. So it puts like an additional burden on, on me to be the best in everything I do, which again, as a black person, it's not easy. I, I have to work much, 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 much harder to prove myself extremely. I have to go the extra mile all the time. I know that my appearance may kind of have people box me, and question me and not accept me or even welcome me, but I'm not afraid. There's something bigger that's in my heart. So the only thing that stops me is if I'm lacking something and I always try not to do that. I'm always reading and always preparing and, and, and trying to make sure that I can be ready for any opportunity that I'm given and any place where they place me that I can stand up and deliver. It's a very delicate job and it needs develop, delicate, thoughtful balance. Every day I bring myself to work, I pray. I pray and I ask for God's wisdom, his guidance, and his spirit. So, come on. I have God. And that's what I have in my pocket every day. I have God. been, I think, the perfect time in Catholic life. I started out in first grade with a nun who had a habit from the top to the bottom and the whole structured convent and all that. And 
Then by the third grade, they were wearing black habits that were like about knee length. And by fifth grade, they were wearing brown habits with no headpiece. And then by the time I was in high school, they were wearing as much makeup as any of the girls in Catholic high school were even allowed to wear. So there's this great unpacking of what it's meant to be living Vatican II. And I was influenced by that. My mom and my dad raised us in the Catholic tradition. But my dad had a very old school growing up in a traditional Czech community. So he grew up with a kind of Catholic guilt thing, right? And my mom, now her mother had been a convert. So she grew up with this extroverted zeal of service and, and the gift of Catholic social teaching. So I just got to absorb that. You know, and in my life, it was always about service, wherever that called me. And it was always about the gift of love and that God was a loving God. And my dad went through a very spiritual transformation. So getting to see his transformation and how he really integrated that into a deep, deep, deep reverence for life and the joy that can be found in faith. So I just got to be at the perfect place in the perfect world that gave me the chance to give back. My mom had had polio and she did amazing things as a person that might not have been seen by the world as having some limitations. I mean, she knew how to engage people. And so we talked a lot at dinner about these deep conversations. And it was at the time of Karen Ann Quinlan. So we had all these talks about morality and end of life issues. And my mom, having spent six months in an iron lung, had very strong opinions about the value of life. And so she influenced my appreciation for healthcare and what it means to be vulnerable and to be in the hands of healthcare people and, and how much responsibility there is with that. When I, when I was seven, my mom gave me this really, really ugly doll, which I didn't understand at the time was the little orphan from the Les Miserables movie, but her eyes were like this big. I remember unpacking her at Christmas and being kind of horrified, like, who is this doll? But it did influence me because as I came to know this doll, it was all about the issue of orphans finding their way in life. And I went through confirmation at an early age. And that meant a lot to me in terms of just understanding the gifts of life and love and trying to aspire to that. When, when I was in eighth grade, I, I was kind of pissed off about the role of women in the church. So for confirmation names, everyone was choosing female names, you know, like Anne or Teresa. So. I chose St. Jerome Emiliani, who is the patron saint of little lost children. And that was a moment of personal recognition where we're all kind of little lost children that need help sorting through, well, sorting through what it means to be truly loved. And how do you live your best self? And how many hard things happen in the world that you have to go through to somehow still come out whole? And be in relationship with others in a way that can be loving, even beyond my professional life. My primary vocation has always been to be a wife, a mother, and now a grandmother. I think, I think my truest vocation, and I mean that in its broadest sense, is identifying with the possibility in what has traditionally been labeled as the feminine. I mean, don't get me wrong. I've done the command and control parts of life and I always have to watch out for how easily that can creep in. But my role as a wife and mother of four amazing kids has taught me how to love and fed my soul. And, and that spills over into how I believe leaders can best serve the world. You know, that sense of wonder, a sense of belonging and, and being completely for each other. When Bridget, our youngest, was two, she was really, really sick. 
and we have three older kids and Jim was working in Canada and my mom had just died. It was a really tough time in our life. So we ended up having this emergency run to the hospital with her, you know, where we got to the place where she was really starting to go downhill. I got there and you know, you're, you're standing in the emergency room with your baby in your arms and she's melting. And you know that from a professional healthcare point of view, like they have to triage, right? And you're there like, take mine, take mine. And it was probably that turning point that made me recognize how vulnerable you are as a patient. I mean, back then they didn't expect people of two to have diabetes. So it was common to be 13 or 14. And, and I'd studied nutrition pretty extensively in my first master's program. So I kept thinking that she was having problems that seemed like diabetes, but it didn't seem like it would be possible with a two-year-old. So anyway, they got her in and she's in the ICU and they've got her in this little crib. She's all hooked up. And I hear the nurses outside the room and one of the nurses says, well, how's she doing? And the other nurse says, well, she's doing fine, but I'm not so sure about her mom. There was just that moment, you know, where you recognize the fragility of life. It can be taken so quickly. And how if it hadn't been for those people hooking her back up and pumping her full of fluids and training me on how to do finger checks and, you know, all the protocols are designed for kids that are 70 or 80 pounds or more. And Bridget was, you know, 24 pounds. So we had to learn how to get the insulin diluted. And then it was, you had to give her a shot at eight o'clock in the morning and then it would peak over the next eight hours. So we'd be running around with Cheerios trying to get her to eat. And I remember the nurses. I remember the diabetes educator, the doctor. They are imprinted on my mind and will always be. They saved my baby. And now she's this beautiful 24 year old. So yeah, for me, that was, that was probably the turning point for me personally around wanting to commit to healthcare, around wanting to recognize people and the mission that they're on and somehow to find a way to lift that up. <laughs> you know, those little lost children that St. Jerome Emiliani served, well, part of his influence was education and Part of it was faith development and believing that there can be a better way if people can just work together. And he also brought up that sense of, of faith that there is hope. It's, it's not just about knowledge. It's about knowledge in action and the value of integration and becoming fully human and what we can be as humans if we really love. You know, for me coming into a corporate job as I took on the vice president of mission with Peace Health, which was very much with the Sisters of St. Joseph of Peace, kind of a grassroots streetwise group of sisters and ending up in an executive suite, the Sisters of St. Joseph, they're a pretty cool group of sisters. They're very eclectic and very social justice oriented. And so working with them was really a gift and they pushed me and they challenged me and I learned a lot and I had that chance to try on the clothes of what it actually means to try to live the mission in a healthcare environment. But as I promoted into the system, it became much more corporate. And I remember we had this meeting in a hotel that was looking out on the park, parks of Portland and as we took a break for lunch, I'm looking at the spread of food and shrimp. And I mean, it was an amazing luncheon for the executive suite. And I looked down out the window and all along the edge of the park on the benches were the homeless. It's just these weeping sores on their legs. And just the contrast for me, it, it was just heartbreaking. And I also felt like I needed to get out into the community to reconnect with what people are really experiencing. So I took a year off. 
I ended up training in the CASA program, which is the court appointed special advocates for foster children, <laughs> because I was trying to understand what is this message in my life about these orphans and where's that going to fit in? I did get to see the court system and the harshness of the foster system and how hard it is on so many people and especially on LGBTQI kids and people of color. So for me to, to feel authentic, I really try to get out of the executive suite and understand the community experience. I mean, you have to be able to actualize this stuff. You have to have all these tactical skills, but if you don't have the heart part of it, you're not doing the service in the way that morally we have the opportunity to influence. So I think that's why I ended up transitioning eventually from HR into mission. It, it was the opportunity to create the container and then really watching people bloom and blossom. And, and so when I think about mission integration, it's how do you take your values and our mission and embed it through the processes that allow that service to be done in a loving way. And it's phenomenal to watch. My mom worked for the church and she had struggles with the church in terms of women being in the church. So she kind of modeled that presence, the value of the female voices, the value of the mothers of the world, you know. And I think somehow our church has to reconcile that because I mean, although men are in the hierarchy, most of the people who are still attending the church are the women, so. I grew into HR when it wasn't a profession, and I kind of grew into mission when it wasn't a profession. And I, I remember showing up at a Catholic Health Association, coming to one of those mission leader meetings, which was a, a very austere group of individuals who, a lot of them were priests or ex-priests or had done some pretty amazing studies in theology or spiritual health. And I came with my HR background and my newly minted master's in Catholic healthcare leadership with my mother brain, right? And most of these were guys. And I remember we had the social event and none of them knew who I was. And they started talking about the CEO who had chosen the mission leader who was little more than a volunteer coordinator not knowing that I was standing right there with them. And so I puffed up my chest and I made sure they knew who I was. And they were a little chagrined. But it was the sisters that invited me to fully participate in the association. I mean, those sisters, they're pretty darn amazing. But it's been an example of sometimes groups of people, institutions and organizations. You know, you kind of close the door behind you and people get a lot of pride and identity out of their role. And so I think the value of Mission Leadership Institute is that we're welcoming in people that might not have the traditional roles, but that have lived experiences. To have, to truly have that opening of the door, like Vatican II, to including people, especially people of color, and those that have been dismissed or marginalized. I mean, Catholic institutions, you know, haven't, traditionally done very well around opening the door for people of color or those with disabilities or inviting young people to have a voice at the table. So allowing ourselves to learn, it's such an important part of building community and growing together. And so there's a long journey for women and a long journey for people of color. And I think we need to commit to the next generation to listening to them. When I was trying to decide about going with Jim to Canada or whether I'd stay in Portland, it was a beautiful moment where I heard that hymn, I will go Lord where you lead me. I will hold your people in my heart. And that's really been my life theme, you know, to respond to what's in front of you. It's been more about a faith journey, a trusting in a sort of a call and response than a specific professional vocation other than to be fully human. And that human development element, the practical part, like how do you feed people? How do you make sure they have shoes? How do you give the orphan in each of us a safe place? 
it really probably in my mind is probably who I've tried to be regardless of what the actual role is. And then there's mission integration and that's what we're all doing. And so I get to watch all these people doing it with their own lives and help lift them up and bring them forward and encourage their work and hold them to something bigger than their own individual self. With COVID now, my dad was like, you know, in the old days, we would have been praying at this time. And I think there's something to that. And that's where mother nature for me comes in. I really do appreciate the feminine spirit and the role mother nature plays in keeping us grounded. I mean, that respect for equilibrium that nature has. During the early days of the pandemic, after the horrible wildfires, I went out for this walk. And as I was walking down the road, there was there was this tree. And it was a clear, sunny day. And the tree was raining. Well, I'm looking around. I'm looking around like, is there a sprinkler here? Or like, what's the deal? The water was definitely coming out of the tree. And so there's this like Moses moment of like the burning bush. Like, right, this is amazing. And Maybe I shouldn't tell anyone about this because they're going to think I'm off my rocker. So I Googled it and there literally is this mechanism in trees that when they get depleted, their roots go down and they suck up water from the earth and they rewater themselves, which is like a way of nature really restoring itself. And there's a beauty in that. It's so natural. That, that phenomenon of nature taking care of itself and us. And we have to learn from nature, right? I never, I, I never, would have thought I'd be working in healthcare. Never. It's not something I, um, you know, some people when they're little kids say, I know I want to be a nurse or I know I want to be a physician or something, you know? I never had a, that strong call to healthcare as a kid. I didn't have like a clear vision. I'm sure I answered, teachers always ask that, but there wasn't anything in particular that was strong for me. I thought at one point about maybe becoming a teacher. I did discern a vocation to the priesthood. Many people wouldn't have been surprised if I'd become a Catholic priest, but I was called to married life. My wife had also contemplated becoming a sister at one point, so that fit. But that's another story. Let me back up a little bit. One of the things that in some ways is the seed that kind of led me on a meandering path to this role that I'm in now goes back to childhood. When I was in eighth grade, my mom took me along with her to volunteer at a soup kitchen. We would go on a fairly regular basis and that had just a tremendous impact on me. You know, I grew up in this bubble and that was the first time that I was seeing an entirely different world beyond that sheltered experience. It raised all kinds of questions like, wow, how, how is it even possible that we, that, that there is a, a situation where people don't have a home, a house to sleep in, or, or that they don't, that there's a context where someone doesn't have food and is unable to eat. What is going on with this? How, how is this happening? And why is this happening? And this is not right. It just raised all kinds of questions. I was so fortunate to then go into a high school, which was a Jesuit high school, that so encouraged that exploration and asking those questions even further. The approach was ask questions of your faith, be examining it. Don't adopt what your parents handed to you. Open it up yourself and ask those questions. They use the analogy of the shoebox. You got all this stuff that your parents have put in your shoebox whether it be values or your faith or any number of things. And you just kind of accepted this shoe box. What we want you to do is to turn it upside down, dump it all out, take a look at it. And then you decide what you're putting back in there. 
and it's your shoebox now. It's not the one that was given to you, it's yours. And really intentionally, not being afraid to challenge things, take ownership. So it's not just something that was handed to you. Make it your own. So that time in high school was, was very formative for me. The other thing that happened um, was my dad died my senior year of high school. I was really close with my parents. Uh, one by one, as my older siblings moved out, the house got quieter and quieter, and I was spending more time with my parents. I had a very good relationship with them. He was diagnosed with cancer just before my senior year began. They initially thought he was going to live a few weeks. That's how advanced it was. It was lung cancer that had spread to his brain and from there to other places. He went in for surgery. They removed a tumor from his brain, but it was right in the speech area of the brain. He was not able to speak. It's, it's the same area used for writing, so he also wasn't able to write, to communicate that way either. Turned out he lived six months, not weeks, but far longer than they'd expected. And through very intense occupational therapy, was able to regain his speech and a little bit of his writing. Those six months, I still look back on those. I mean, of course, they were some of the most challenging months, but they were, it sounds strange, but they're some of the most grace-filled moments of my life as I look back on it. It was just, it was a very, very special time of just deep, deep, deep connection. My family was very open about what was happening with him dying. We talked about it a lot, we cried together a lot. My dad and I had lots of very intimate conversations during that time, acknowledging what was happening. It was just such a time of grace. He died just a few weeks after I turned 18 that spring. That's young to have a big loss like that. And I think that in some ways it like opened my heart. I had a very supportive high school community that allowed me to be vulnerable and held that and respected that. And so one of the things that I have just felt throughout my life is a very strong sense of love, very deeply, a, a deep, deep well of love from God that even through really tough times is a deep anchor. It cracked open a, a part of compassion in some ways. We can be so uncomfortable walking with people in suffering sometimes. Having gone through that experience enabled me, I think, to be more comfortable in walking with people, not understanding what others are going through by any means, I'm not saying that, but just having a level of comfort with being with someone else's discomfort. After college, I, I knew I wanted to live in a community that had spirituality as its focus and doing some sort of service. That led to serving with Jesuit volunteers in Tanzania. I lived there for two years in community teaching on the southern part of Lake Victoria in northern Tanzania. It was there that I encountered the Jesuit refugee service. I felt really strongly called to that work. After I finished my time as a Jesuit volunteer, I ended up working with the JRS in a different part of Tanzania, right on the border with Burundi. That was a very, that conflict was very similar to Rwanda. I mean, I saw, I mean, the number of refugees increased tremendously in the time that I was there. 
the whole mission of JRS was, first of all, to a company, to walk with, to be with people, to serve, and to advocate. I just love that. It just resonated so much with me. There's something different about the Jesuit refugee service, how they serve people. You actually take the time to listen to the stories. We weren't there to just do something, but to really listen. A big piece of that ministry was recognizing these people were experiencing a really difficult time and and that for them to know that they are seen loved and cared for requires taking time to really listen to them not just you know here's your thing move on i i remember i remember this one story a young man he was in his 20s he was a parent his name was emmanuel he was born during a previous period of significant civil unrest. His parents were in the process of fleeing and were hiding in what he described was like a hole in a field so that soldiers couldn't see them. And he was born during that time that his parents were hiding. Fast forward, and this child has grown into an adult, has children of his own, and has yet again had to flee from another cycle of violence. You would see little kids as all kids around the world do, they kind of create their own little toys. I remember being really struck one time with these kids who had built a series of little houses out of dirt and little scraps of plastic that they used as roofs of the houses. And they were creating a little refugee camp. They were recreating what was the only reality they had ever known. There's a situation where children are living for years, where that is the only reality they know. That is just heartbreaking. I actually worked uh, in DC with the Jesuits, this, this is later, working on advocacy issues and justice issues. And I saw decisions being made in faraway cities like Brussels or Washington, DC, are having a direct impact on the lives of these children and families and moms in the refugee camps about things like funding. Funding is cut short, guess what happens? The food rations go down, the soap rations go down. What happens next? Violence increases, domestic violence increases, rape and sexual assault increases. We as human beings have to do better than that and be better than that. And it's not just in refugee camps. We have an affordable housing crisis in this country. It impacts everyone. And you don't know, it, it could be your neighbor. Or maybe your neighbor now is in a very different place. Five years ago, he was on Medicaid. I was in a board meeting at one point and a board member shared that they had an experience in their life where they were living out of a car, said, no one would know that now. I am by all measures very successful. And unless I shared this with you, all would have no idea that's a part of my experience as a human being, that I actually experienced homelessness. That was such a stark reminder to me that we don't know people's stories. Hearing people's stories is essential. That is how you break stereotypes and stigmas. There were so many inspirational pieces from the time in the refugee camps. The camps were, were very, very well organized. Each house had an address. And so they divided up into the, uh, the camps into small clusters of communities. And I was so moved um, when someone would get sick and needed to be in the hospital at the camp for a few days the people in that little cluster would get together and share that this was a time of limited food rations, et cetera. They would share their food rations. They would cook for that family. And seeing those who are already living very much on the edge, coming together and giving up that little bit that had already been reduced even further, 
to share amongst themselves and take care of each other in that way. You, you know, it, it was so humbling, so incredibly humbling. And what tremendous lessons can be learned from their witness and example. They were living the gospels in a way that it just blew me away. That's one thing about the refugee camp. So many of the gospel stories, I saw them in an entirely different light. They came alive in a way they never had, not, not in this way. I could literally see some of these stories, like how they could happen. There's a, a story in Mark's gospel, Jesus walking down the road, big, big group. And Bartimaeus, who's blind, is sitting by the side of the road, and he finds out it's Jesus who's walking. So he starts calling out to Jesus, and the crowd near him gets mad at him and tells him to be quiet. But he's persistent, and Jesus hears him. And it's like, I'm sure that crowd wasn't silent. You've got a huge crowd of people. It's going to be loud. And through all of that commotion and noise, Jesus hears the voice of the lowliest person in the group, the one that has the least amount of power. He then has to make a decision. Is he going to stop or is he going to keep going? And he stops. He tells his disciples, bring that man over. I want to talk to him. And he doesn't assume what he needs. He knows he's blind, but he very respectfully asks him, what can I do for you? I think that's one little story that's an example for us. As we think about our patient care, how we relate to one another, and just being good humans to one another. What are the voices we hear? And when we hear them, what do we do? Do we decide to stop and act? When I think about mission integration, it's how do you take your values and our mission and embed it through the processes that allow service to be done in a loving way. And to make sure that in every decision we make and in everything we do, we're very thoughtful of our caregivers, we're very thoughtful of the poor and vulnerable, and that we're courageous in doing the right thing. Jack knew that it was a biblical mandate, justice, as right relationships, justice as special concern for the vulnerable and disadvantaged, justice as unflinching advocacy in the face of systems and structures that harm people. Everybody has got profound stories that if we just sort of extract them, we can help them see moments where they have been living mission, whatever that mission might be. Boiling that mission down is really about love. That's really our mission, is to let people know they're loved, a bold, and yet in some ways, simple mission. Just three words, love, forgiveness, reconciliation. Just those three words, they work wonders in every field, every culture, every tradition. They work wonders in my own heart. And then really watching people bloom and blossom. It's phenomenal to watch. John Kleider. Nancy Jordan. Sister Lorraine Marie Delaney, CSJ. Mary Ellen Glazer.
Roseanne Ponzetti. Teresa Burvell. We're going to encourage those of you who uh, are muted to come on. And those of us in the audience who have been audience members rather than participants, like the ones that are coming up right now, please join us if you wish by just uh, turning your uh, video on. Uh, you, otherwise, you can stay um, with your video off if you're more comfortable, but do join us if you can and I will do some introductions. Uh, first of all, you know Doris Baisley, so Dory and I will be kind of monitoring this discussion following. Um, I'm going to follow just along my what is coming up for me so I don't miss anybody. So next to me is Bonnie Benfield, who did uh, Teresa uh, uh, Bevel's uh, story as a writer and actor. Next to them, Sister Jane Delisle and Sister Sharon Becker, uh, both of whom are representatives from CSJ's uh, for St. Joseph Health, Providence St. Joseph Health now, Martin Shriver, whom you met earlier, Roseanne Ponsetti, uh, whom Kath Kristoff uh, did. Kath is teaching tonight, Roseanne, so she's not joining us. Val Lamar Jansen, who's, um, uh, who did uh, one of our sister, one of the uh, mission officers from India, Sister Lorraine, uh, during the during the the worst of the COVID crisis that hit um, hit India at that time. Her husband Frank uh, did the music, the original scoring for this event. Nancy Jordan, whom you met earlier, and we welcome back. Um, uh, uh, Beth Ruscio, who did um, one of the other stories that we did not use, um, uh, Marianne, uh, Marianne Glazer, whose husband was very influential in medical ethics for Providence St. Joseph Health, Teresa Bravel, um, who I believe you are, Teresa, you are with the Alaska uh, uh, Providence, uh, Providence. Uh, John Clyderer, uh, whose story you heard Louise uh, Selgas tell tonight, Dory Baisley, whom you have met. And let's see, are we joined by anybody else? Anyone from the audience going to join us? We would love to have you just all your photos, all your pictures up uh, to join us. Okay, feel free to come in whenever you want. Um, I think you just have to hit um, uh, your video to let that go on. All right, well, let's open the discussion then a little bit. Oh, 
Paulette, Joanna are joining us. Wonderful. This is great. And um, Stephanie is taking a few minutes to get you on. So if you're not on quite yet, don't despair. She's working at it. She's having to do you one at a time. Okay. All right. I think we will go ahead and start, though, because people are hearing, even if they're not joining us yet. Um, um, would anybody like, uh, Martin or Nancy, would you like to start us off with anything? Uh, and then we'll turn it over to, if you, if you want to direct uh, what you think Jane and Sharon Becker can, can, can assist us in. So I'll turn it over to Martin and Nancy right now. Well, Sister Judith, I just want to thank everyone for this moment because it, it was quite vulnerable as we uh, listened to the stories. And I, I want to turn it over to people's reaction. Uh, th these are times in a pandemic where there are big emotions and also a lot of truth that is being made. And so I, I think we, both Nancy and I appreciate the opportunity to just listen to people's truth, which is what I think we've established tonight. Maybe we'll just start allowing people to still come on. We'll start by turning it over to Jane and Sharon. Um, I don't know whether you saw the original production, either of you, uh, when we showed it. I did. Uh, and maybe we, you can just share with us a little bit about um, how the Mission Leadership Institute connects with our charism as Sisters of St. Joseph, or whatever you feel is appropriate to share at this point. So, Jane well, and Sharon. This is Jane. The Mission Institute, um, it provides a forum, a way of, for people to claim their full giftedness. And it provides a way that spirituality is integrated into all of life. And it, oh, just the speakers that were on the three presentations we heard tonight, um, they spoke with such passion about their lived experience and the way the mission, their personal mission and the mission of Providence St. Joseph affects their life, how they give themselves to it. But it's not a new thing. It's like their lived experience from the past comes forward. Their own story is, is rooted and grounded in their own spirituality then that they give away in this context and make a space for people to flourish and to become their best self. And in becoming our best selves, spirituality is integrated, integrated with that. And the charism of the Sisters of St. Joseph has always been to bring people together and bring them to God and to, to work with whatever is needed in the moment um, for whatever a person might need. But to do it with compassion, with joy, with love, with um, gentleness that brings forth the gifts of the other person. And addressing whatever needs happen to be right there before them. And it really is, as the, the uh, one story was saying, um, it is about the love of God. Actually, everybody alluded to that. It is about the love of God in each person. And how does that flow out? Enough for right now. I think for me, it was self-evident that the seeds of the values were implanted when people were children. And it's um, people being drawn towards a corporation, if we could call ourselves a corporation, that lives the values that they speak. And I think this uh, came through all the stories that the mission and the values is very much alive, not only within their own lives, but it was very evident with uh, in the lives of those with whom they are in ministry. So it's almost like uh, Providence St. Joseph Health is this huge magnet that draws people towards us who have the same desire that we have to live out this mission of Jesus. Um, I think the other thing too, um, that was very evident to me too, in all the stories is the, um, the relationship that people have with God, that God is at the center of their lives. And that is lived out uh, in their daily interaction with others. What, one more, more piece. What I loved also was the fact that the person who works with the health system and is trying to inspire and, and influence and help other people live out the mission have done that in their own families. I love the teddy bear story. I mean, 
that says something about how values are instilled in the children. I love the fact that um, I, I think it was John who who was brought to um, his idea of service, his questioning of why people are poor, all those things through his mother, and then the compassion that was released through his father. It, it's just amazing to me. I, it, uh, thank you, Jane. And, and I really, um, uh, this is about our, uh, our mission uh, and leadership in a time when there are lots of questions about yes. our hospitals and how a hospital meets the current crises and our ethics in a sense. I, I want to, before I open it up to everybody to just open discussion, I want to introduce Mary O'Malley who joined us and Mary was the writer and actor for Nancy Jordan. So, <laughs> and John, I believe this is the first time you're seeing your story, isn't it? John Clyder? Uh, yes, yeah. So <laughs> you're still alive. <laughs> <laughs> Luis could not join us today, but he was oh, that's delighted to meet yeah. you and, and to hear your story. And I think he did a lovely job with it. So what I'd like to do now is literally open it up for anybody who is here um, to just chat. And I, I think we can talk about any of the topics we want, either the, 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 the art itself that we did, are the, the mission and charism that, that was representative here, uh, how this is going to be used, whatever is of importance to you. Dory, you did you? Yes, I just thought before we go any farther, I wanted to thank Sister Sharon Becker for being the person who thought of this whole connection between the LMU project and Martin and the Institute. Right. And it was just a lovely match. And, and we thank you because you know what it was like to have done one of these stories. <laughs> <laughs> Mary wrote it and it was one of the greatest. Right. <laughs> Sharon Becker worked in um, Papua New Guinea as a midwife for many years. And uh, she shared some incredible stories with us. So, okay. So it is open for people to just um, share, ask, reflect. Cheer. I would like to say something. I um, have been involved with this from the beginning. I had the privilege of interviewing Teresa Burvell and doing her story. And I want to say, listening to these stories again tonight, I was moved as if I had not heard them before. And it's almost like I feel like I would like to have this to be able to put on sometime because quite frankly, the news that you get about people who are religious and so-called spiritual today is very hateful. You know, it is very non-inclusive. It is very exclusionary. And to be able to hear the stories of people who are talking about what comes from their hearts and what has been in their hearts from childhood. And to know that these people exist and that they're still operating in the world is a very inspirational thing for me. It's life-giving, it's life-affirming. And I feel like this is, this is one of the perks of this kind of storytelling. And this is also one of the wonderful things about working with a group like this, because there is, like Martin said, such a vulnerability. We were very fortunate that, that our participants like let us in in that way and that we were able to share their vulnerabilities and their and the etiology of their faith and their giving and i just want to thank them again i want to thank you know everybody for creating this environment where we can share this sort of love and goodwill and remember that there are these people in the world 
I would also just uh, want to note that Bonnie and Dory Baisley were both co-editors for this project, and I want to acknowledge the beautiful work they did with our writers. <coughs> so again, just open, open panel um, response, questions, anything. Well, I wasn't able to be on at the very beginning, but I, I was so touched when I came on and heard the young man speaking and then heard others. You know, there are so many people who are the living and walking presence of Christ among us in our world. And we don't, don't hear about them. We don't see it. Mm -hmm. um, it's not making the newspapers, of course, or television, but um, it certainly raises our consciousness. There is so much beauty and goodness. If that could only be publicized. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Judith, for sending this. Thank you, Kathleen. Nancy. Uh, Bonnie, I, I also um, was so moved by hearing these stories now a second time, possibly a third time. Uh, I, you know, uh, Roseanne and John uh, and Teresa are my coworkers. They're my colleagues. And so I've sat with them in meetings and I, you know, we've exchanged niceties. But to hear again the depth uh, and Sister Kathleen, as you speak of, you know, they, they are the face of God. And I think of a concept that we speak of quite frequently in, in the Providence system, and that is sacred encounters. And I think of these, this experience as truly sacred, you know, truly set apart, you know, moments that sort of catch your breath. And, you know, Roseanne, I'm, I'm singing right along with you and I will go, Lord, where you lead me, you know, I, and find those commonalities and, you know, where my heart touches your heart. And I mean, just all of these sort of um, uh, feelings uh, sort of struck me again by hearing this and observing this and experiencing it a second and third time. And then as a, um, as a recipient of this gift as well and having um, the wonderful Mary um, tell my story, uh, it's so humbling. It's so, so humbling. And as, uh, you know, as a mission leader that's, you know, striving to grow and, and be formed and to, you know, to continually develop. Uh, it's, it's, I was thinking of the uh, Michael Jackson man in the mirror, right? I'm, I'm looking in that mirror and to hear my story meant the world to me as well. And um, it's just such a gift to be a part of this experience. While we're waiting for the next person, I also wanna thank our people who um, sent comments on the chat. Uh, for some lovely comments that they have added. So I might say just a few words. I know my computer might not be <laughs> super connected, so I hope that you can hear me all right. We can hear. Yeah. I, um, I think the term that comes to mind for me is humble. Um, truthfully, listening to John, your story, and just a, such a beautiful, beautiful, story. I hadn't heard that one yet. And I really have to say that as much as we as mission leaders um, get the privilege of the role that we are in, it really is about witnessing the amazing stories that don't get told. And I'm thinking in particular, um, just the conversations that I've heard today around our caregivers who are um, really short staffed and that are working long hours and that are continuing to show up and continuing to do their best and continuing to walk through this crazy two year <laughs> pandemic of walking into the unknown. And, um, and that's humbling that, that as a mission leader, it's, it's not as much about our stories as it is about the stories that we're just yes. so privileged to get to give witness to. And so I just wanna call that out in the context of the people that are living every day in our in our services and they're delivering care. Um, we ran a program for um, the elderly in Portland. The, it's called the PACE program. It's an elder place type of a program where um, we have people who are in um, housing that are some of the most frail elderly there are. And COVID's been horrible in terms of the toll it's taken on the participants. But these folks that continue to show up to make sure they have their meals, that you know the staffing is hard, the drivers who could make 20 times more of the amount of money to work for Amazon, and they just 
they show up and they care and they know the participants by name and by story. And so it's just really humbling. I appreciate so much the opportunity to be part of this and the storytelling, because that's really where it comes to is the lived experience of people day to day. So uh, I just want to call out for mission leaders, we get the privilege of getting to walk, walk that and the, on um, so many levels. It's about so many more people than, than us. So thank you. And you're right, Roseanne, those are stories that need to be told. Yeah. Hi, my name is Teresa. What a great opportunity. And um, thank you to Bonnie and to all the other storytellers. We, we just love you and you know your talent is just so beautiful. And I just wanted to add that this is so important because the values and the beliefs and who we are today are really historical realities that we are living. And to think that we are here today and yet someday when we play these stories, they are going to belong to that cycle of the historical realities that people present during that moment are going to experience. Mm -hmm. And that's the power of stories. Mm -hmm. That's the power of what you've done. Mm -hmm. It's not just creating it today, but people coming after us are going to see this someday and be so grateful because it's going to touch who they are and their own experiences as well. So thank you to everyone. This is so beautiful. And to see John, John, thank you. I really <laughs> like your story. <laughs> and Rosen, <laughs> thank you. Well, I know that I've, I've learned so much about mission from your teddy bear story that I will never forget, Teresa. <laughs> So this is this was my first opportunity to to see these, and um, as others have said, I am just so filled with inspiration. Bonnie, I loved how you how you put that. There's so much darkness and heavy stuff that we're hearing these days, and uh, Teresa and Roseanne, I, I, I'm just lifted up by listening to your stories, and I am. It is such a gift, really such a gift to have the opportunity to serve in a role like this. I mean, it's just amazing that these roles even exist and it's it's such a blessing. But I, I am so, um, Bonnie, as I was listening to you, what, what struck me was a, a part of our mission statement in Providence St. Joseph Health, really the core of it begins with acknowledging that each of us is an expression, an instrument of God's healing love and what each of us can bring into the world. Um, it, Bonnie, that came to me as, as you were speaking and it, it, you were, how you were inspired by this, as was I in, in listening to these stories. And I look at these faces on this Zoom call and how I'm seeing the, the expression and the face of God in each one of these little boxes. And that's just beautiful. So thank you for creating this opportunity. So true, John, yeah. John, one of the things I love about your story is that your school held that space for you when you were uh, in high school. And that is such a special thing. And it really, it's a wonderful thing that that was provided for you you know, and that you're kind of like paying it forward in the sense that you, I mean, that's not what's driving you, but it, it was a seed that your mother planted that they planted that also has continued to blossom. And I, I just love that. It, it, was, it's, it was such a powerful experience of community and what a community can do to foster love and healing for one another. I'm gonna come back, uh, sort of hearing uh, some of what they have said, Jane or Sharon, are there any thoughts that you want to give to the, the mission leaders that we've told stories about? 
you know, the, the, as people were speaking and then I was watching the stories, there's something about the power of each person's story that is about them, but how their experience then is turned around and they give themselves away. There's a richness in that and there's a great humility in it. The power of their own spiritual lives and how they informed them and kind of like made lemonade out of lemons sometimes is really a very a powerful gift. And so for mission leaders to bring out the best in other people, to bring your best self forward, not in a boastful kind of way, but in a, a humble zeal kind of way, mm -hmm. where it, it you're, you give yourself away for whatever's needed in the moment and you bring the best out of other people. What a gift that is. It takes a great deal of um, talent and giftedness by God's grace in your life, education, all the rest that goes into making you who you are. But the fact that you, you have sifted through your own story and discerned how God was at work, even in difficult times mm -hmm. and in wonderful times, whether it's teddy bears trying to get on the plane and pay all that extra money or any of the other stories that we heard here, um, the power of story and the power of someone's humble zeal is just phenomenal. It, it gives you hope for the future for our hospitals, doesn't it? It does. It <laughs> does. These are our mission leaders. Yeah. Nancy, you were talking, uh, Martin and, and you and I and Dory have been talking uh, about the pup, how this might be used. Uh, is there anything you want to share with people about that? I know that when we first started talking to Martin in the early brainstorming time, uh, Dory and I were very clear that we did not do the sort of poster board um, or a PowerPoint at work. That's not what we did. And so if we were talking about mission, uh, that wasn't the direction that we thought was most powerful and he agreed and um, supported us in that, that we could then talk about how the mission was enfleshed by these human beings. But Nancy, uh, you had, thoughts, I know you and Martin, but you, I think you're in charge of taking it forward. How is this going to be used or what, what's the thoughts? Well, gosh, we are, again, as you can tell, the enthusiasm for this is just so profound. Uh, and we are, are so thrilled that this will sort of join the repertoire, if you will, of our discerning mission leaders um, in terms of their whole person development. So rather than say, oh, let's look at some research articles or let's write a research paper or here's a, a quiz in sort of traditional academia, which of course I'm a big fan and has its very important place, this will sort of um, serve to reach that, that mind, body, spirit, that, that whole person. So I envision us using this um, in conversation, in sort of, we have one-on-one -on -one mentor companion relationship set up for our discerning mission leaders in the Mission Leadership Institute. And so this could be used in, uh, as, as sort of a dialogue um, foundation, as a, as a basis for conversation. You know, what, what, what spoke to you? What, what do you relate with? How can you find um, this within yourself? What if someone told your story? What if someone, so there's a lot of prompts that I see coming from this so effortlessly and so naturally. Uh, and, and I just can't wait to get to the whiteboard and with Martin and do some more brainstorming on it. Uh, I also just love the multidimensional aspect of it, meaning, you know, each time you sort of revisit it, it's, it, sort of evokes different reaction, different response. So I want to somehow relay that um, and capture that for our discerning mission leaders. Martin, what do you think? Agree. We're going to launch something in the next couple of weeks called a masterclass. And that will be an opportunity for new mission leaders and this discerning mission leader group to come to understand what is it about this type of a role. One of the unique partnership uh, outcomes here has been to really say, this is an opportunity for us to go to the margins and, and find the next mission leader. And not to just have it be from this traditional mindset, 
Um, but from one where I'm on the phone with people from Disney, people from uh, creative minds of consulting firms, how can they become the next face of the John Clyder or the Roseanne Panzetti uh, and, and Teresa Ravel to bring us forward into a, a, the next generation of leadership that I think is needed in this changing healthcare environment. So as we launch that, we'll begin to take some of these vignettes and help them be really the textbooks. Uh, the challenge of this project at the beginning, Judith, you know this, was to find who would be those first people. Yes. And we have over 70 mission leaders throughout the ministry. And I would wonder what, what will they be in terms of telling a story? So they have a guide now, but won't it be powerful to develop a repertoire of all of these people? Uh, I think is very exciting. And I would just say in a final kind of comment, um, one of the ways that has inspired me has been the work of Melka Muggeridge, who went and interviewed uh, Mother Teresa. And it was one of the first interviews. And what he did was he captured the light of Mother Teresa, and it launched her story into the, the parlance of all of the world. And what I feel like went on here with all of you is that you launched the light of these human beings that I knew were beautiful, but now you have portrayed them in the light of, of how they're seen. And that's in his book is called Something Beautiful for God. And I think that's what this was all about. Thank you. Uh, Jane, you were, I think, wanted to say something a few minutes ago. Do you still? I do, and I think Sharon wanted to say something as well. So you want to go first? Okay. In light of what you just said, both um, Nancy and Martin, I, as you were talking, I thought, wouldn't it be a wonderful thing? It has a good, it's a good spiritual discipline in some way of reflecting on your own personal story. <laughs> what were those places of grace and influence in your life? What were those places? That sometimes they're difficult times, and sometimes it's beautiful times. And yet, how does all? Where are the? Where are those places of grace that formed you into who you are today? And that's what you bring to the mission. Yeah, because sometimes what I've heard from uh, folks in different levels, right, is um, their uncertainty about being in the role. And for me, it's about believing that God has been shaping your life for this moment. Um, and so faith becomes a huge dimension of this, that you've been called. And if, like Jane said, if people can reflect back on those touchstone moments where God was evident, um, I think it begins to give this beautiful, beautiful vessel. We just had this first session of the Mission Leadership Institute. But, you know, we are becoming vessels God's creative work uh, in our world to bring about so much goodness. Huh? So I think I agree with Jane. I think if people could reflect back on their lives in terms of how God has been shaping them for this moment, for this call, and it's up to us individually to respond to it um, in a manner that's consistent with our own life story. Sharon, I'd like to, to jump off of what you just said and use and give your very words about being called as mission leaders to the artists who are on this call, uh, this Zoom, that you are also called yes. uh, with your art uh, mm -hmm. by God, with a, with, with a, a vocation to, to do this work. Um, mm -hmm. And that like the mission leaders, you also are doing that work. Uh, and so thank you for the giving the gifts back, so to speak. So I, I, thought, I thought they were the real person. <laughs> you were so credible. I thought you were the real person until, you know, I know how Judith works, so I knew that, but you, it felt like you were the real person. And the thing about using art, art speaks louder and longer than any other words you could ever say. So the art is important. Art and beauty is important to the whole development of the human person. Agreed. Well, thank you. Thank you. So just to respond to what Judith just said, the, um, you know, to, in, to interview, it feels like a, a kind of holy pact, H-O-L-Y, that you are making with the person that you're talking to because you are, you're not per se interviewing them, you're having a conversation and in order to 
to be, you know, for them to be um, forthcoming, you also have to be open and forthcoming. So the what it requires of you to be that person has been a really, um, I think, a life changing thing for me. I've been doing this now for, I don't know, a dozen years in various capacities. And it's an amazing thing to see in a day, in a sort of everyday way, you know, someone's soul in action when they're talking to you um, and to feel your own rise to meet it. So it's, it's a, it's been a great, wonderful thing in my life. I've, I've felt really blessed. And I'll just mention that uh, the story that Beth told, uh, that Dory wrote and Beth uh, performed, uh, Nancy's story that uh, Mary O'Malley, I think she had to leave, got a little family to take care of, and that Val, Val telling Sister Lorraine's story, those are online, uh, both with Martin, so that they're available through uh, the Institute or they're available through the CSJ Center. And I believe any of you that had a flyer to register uh, have that um, link. So you can get into the CSJ Center um, uh, website and those are there. So John, you get to sneak a peek at what Nancy's life was like. <laughs> So I think we are um, a little bit over time, although we had originally said we'd go till 6.30, uh, but we changed that to six because we know that everyone here is working overtime um, at home and at work and every other place. So I think I, I just want to uh, end again by thanking the generosity, uh, first of all, and support from Martin, Nancy, Jane, Sharon, the community that have supported the work that is being done with this institute, the leadership that is being provided. Um, you make us proud to be, make me proud to be of CSJ and these artists proud to work with you. I want to say thank you to the artists who, who I think sing the songs of God. Um, with such beautiful voices, particularly in this media. Uh, I want to thank the mission leaders who shared their stories um, and apparently were the first pick from, uh, from Martin uh, to represent this project. So uh, thank you for your generosity uh, and the vulnerability, which we've heard several times tonight, that it takes to be available to people. You do give us hope for the future. Uh, just stay well, stay healthy in mind and body and soul, and go get a great dinner and a good night's rest. Thank you all. <laughs>